Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, join some of the other speakers here in thanking uh, Charlie here for a fantastic uh, symposium. We're nearing the end here, and uh, it's been a really a great experience. What I would like to do today is uh, add to the previous uh, three or four speakers and uh, highlight a little bit about the experience at the HULC, as it was announced. It stands for Hand and Upper Limb Center, um, and we're located in London. Uh, we have no financial disclosures, and what I really wanted to do was to tell you about how we came to using this technique, and I would like to foster a discussion, particularly here in North America, uh, the surgeons in North America have uh, come late to the table, I think, uh, with this uh, technique. Where are we located? We're located in London, Ontario, which is a little town between Toronto and Detroit. Um, and uh, we are a center with four plastic surgeons, eight orthopedic surgeons, and yesterday you heard some of the work that we've done in the lab. A real claim to fame is really this gentleman. This is Bob McFarlane. Uh, he established our hand center a number of years ago, and I was one of his last residents. And everybody knows him in the context of Dupuytren's contracture, but in fact, in Canada, he was a very famous person for other achievements. Uh, and yesterday, some people talked about that he was a great athlete. He started in 1946 at the University of Western Ontario. And in the next five years, the football team, the Mustangs at the University of Western Ontario, four times won the Yates Cup. And that's sort of like winning the NCAA trof trophy in, uh, in football four times in a row. He kicked football, he was a running back, and 60 years later, there's still a number of records that he established are still on, on, uh, on, on the books. He uh, won the uh, Lou Mars Trophy in 1951, and that's not a very uh, uh, well-known trophy outside of Canada. But it's the uh, trophy for the best athlete in Canada. And some previous winners uh, who are a little bit more recent are Bobby Orr, Wayne Gretzky, Sidney Crosby, Gilles Lavilleneuve, the racer, uh, Katrina LeMaydon. So these are very, very accomplished athletes. And so he was uh, in that spectrum of athletes at that time. One of the other uh, uh, legacies of Dr. McFarlane was that he was adamantly against uh, needle upon erotomy. It was actually previously published uh, before Le Merzeau, actually in the early 90s. Um, and he felt that uh, fasciectomy and radical fasciectomy were really the ways to treat this disease. And he really became very famous about his detailed anatomical descriptions that all of you have seen. So he died in 2006, and shortly after that, I started doing this needle upon Iran. <laughs> <laughs> the master was gone, I was allowed to do it. And what I'm going to present to you today is a prospective series of my recent needle upon Iranomies. Uh, and I'm going to present to you a prospective series of patients that I've done since September of 2009. And I was really curious to see how our results would stand up compared to the results in the literature. And so the way I do it is slightly different from the previous uh, speakers. Um, I use the needle, uh, I, I use very little local anesthesia, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.5 cc's to just uh, anesthetize the skin. And then I move the needle uh, from radial to ulnar and actually slice the cord. So instead of puncturing it, I slice the cord. Um, and I feel that if I have good contact with the cord, um, it's a pretty safe procedure uh, in the palm of the hand if there is a uh, palpable cord. Uh, and this is what you see afterwards, uh, two or three or four of these uh, little needle sticks. So here's a patient uh, with an unusual cord on the radial side to the index finger. You can see it here, web space, with about uh, 45 or 50 degrees of contracture. This is uh, preoperatively and here postoperatively. It's about a three minute procedure and it works very well. So the report today is about uh, a prospective enrollment of my patients since September of last year. Uh, the inclusion criteria were primarily MCP contractures and the exclusion criteria were mainly uh, that they were not recurrences. I felt 
uh, it easier to do it on people with uh, palpable abductor cords, and those were mainly the patients that would be present to me. So I recorded the MCP, PIP, and DIP joint uh, contractures, made a diagram of what it looked like preoperatively, and then measured the total digital extension deficit. And I followed them up at six to eight weeks, and that's what, I pre what I'm going to present today. So uh, there were about 62 fingers in this last little series that I followed, uh, pretty much according to the literature uh, between males and females. Uh, mostly ring fingers, some uh, small fingers and long fingers. So this is uh, the results of this small group that I'm presenting on. Um, the total extension uh, deficit was uh, 46 degrees preoperatively and it reduced to 14 degrees and at six weeks that was maintained. Uh, mostly the uh, uh, correction was in the MP joint, very much as was previously uh, described. In the PIP joint, we got some uh, improvement, but really not as much and as impressive at the PIP joint. So these results are pretty much as what is in the literature. Um, in terms of complications, I had no neurovascular injuries, and honesty uh, uh, makes me tell that I had one instance of flexor tendon laceration that occurred recently. A patient who, three days after the needle aponeurotomy, actually stopped flexing his fingers. He didn't come back till the sixth week. Uh, fo uh, follow up and uh, I had to repair it. It was not a problem. It was uh, just at the border of zone one and zone two and I was able to repair it primarily. So in summary, I had an overall 32 degree improvement, a residual 14 degree uh, total extension <coughs> deficit, uh, and I found it most useful for MP joint contractures. Uh, the reason why I find it most useful is that at that point, uh, usually it's a pre-central cord, the cord is relatively far away from the neurovascular bundles and later I've always been a little bit worried about getting closer to the neurovascular bundle. There are obviously great limitations to a small study like this. It's a very short-term follow-up, only six or eight weeks, falls within the, the numbers that were uh, told before. Um, and my conclusion is that it may be beneficial for a select group of patients and maybe it's an adjunct prior to open fasciotomy in very serious patients. But that was not the real lesson for me. And I started thinking about what this actually was and I had to go back all the way to 2002 to really learn what this actually meant for me. And this is an article in 2002 where this gentleman uh, is quoted with a big headline, we should be given a choice. Now this is not about something contentious as abortion or so, but this is about Dupuytren's contracture and I'd like you to focus there where he said that this gentleman had to go to Europe for an operation to correct a hand disability and he couldn't understand why he couldn't get the procedure in Canada. He actually went to talk to the Ministry of Health, the Federal Minister of Health, and I look back at that, and I was actually quoted in this article as well. So here it is. I would never do that procedure because I think it's an unsafe procedure. Not only once I said it, I said it twice. Personally, I would never stick a needle in there and use it as a saw. And so my real lesson for this uh, uh, test was actually that never is not very long. And I think that <laughs> applies to uh, Dupin's contracture. So I'm going to leave you with the last picture of Dr. McFarland here in our partnership. This was uh, shortly before he died. He was a great man, and I learned a lot from him. Thanks.